Hi, my name is Jason Cho. I'm here to talk to you about functional programming with Folktale. So what is Folktale? Well, before I talk about Folktale, I should talk about something called Fantasyland. Fantasyland is the specification for a number of the standard, standard structures ported over from mathematical category theory and abstract algebra to functional programming. It includes structures such as monads, func uh, functors, and mon uh, monoids. These are fairly advanced functional programming concepts and might be unfamiliar to you, but you already know one of them, uh, functors. A functor is simply something that can be mapped over, like, such as arrays. So going back to Folktale, uh, Folktale is a suite of functional programming libraries containing a collection of data types implementing a various parts of the fantasy land specification and a small collection of companion utility functions. These types of things are like are maybe, either, task, which I'll be covering la uh, later, and validation. Uh, it provides data types found typically in functional programming languages, ones which make it substantially easier to program in a functional manner. And finally, it allows for the con construction of elegant and robust programs with highly reusable abstractions to keep the code base maintainable. So why use functional programming? It's, let's talk about some pros and cons of using functional programming over the more common uh, imperative programming. One benefit is that it uses immutable data structures only, so that it's much easier to reason about the state at any execution point. Uh, there's also no side effects, meaning the output of the function is strictly based on, on your input. So it's very predictable. Parallelism means that any object can be shared across multiple threads without worrying about concurrency uh, access issues. It also lends itself towards modular elegant design, which makes for less spaghetti code. Uh, some cons, however. Um, some of those pros can actually also be cons. Real world programs are all about side effects and mutation. When users type in something, they want that state to replace whatever state used to be there. This makes it harder to justify using a language that works against the domain being modeled. People are used to thinking in terms of states, and thus it seems a, to be a bit harder to learn uh, functional language. Um, a well-known downside of la uh, lazy functional programming is that it's very difficult to predict the time and space costs of evaluating a lazy functional program. This is something that not even experts can do. But this, pro uh, this problem is fundamental to the paradigm, and it isn't going to go away. So I thought this was a great quote from the book, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. It follows, uh, we are about to study the idea of a computational process. Computational processes are abstract beings that inhabit computers. As they evolve, processes manipulate other abstract data things called data. The evolution of a process is directed by a pattern of rules called a program. And people create programs to direct processes. In effect, we conjure the spirits of the computer with our spells. In programming, we solve pro uh, problems by breaking them into smaller parts and then putting them, such things, uh, smaller parts, back together somehow to construct the whole solution. Uh, the same is largely true in functional programming. We break problems down into smaller problems, solve them, and put them back together to solve the large one. Because of this, most of the emphasis in functional programming is in composition. More, more concretely, functional programs try to find the right data structures to represent the problem and then figure out how to transform such data structures from the original problem into the proposed solution. Given that trans transformations from the problem to the solution are usually too big, uh, functional programs break these transformations into smaller transformations, and even smaller transformations, and then build a big transformation by using the smaller ones. Transformations in functional programming are captured by, as one would probably have guessed, functions. And the act of putting such functions back together to form bigger things is called function composition. Functional programming places heavy emphasis in composition, specifically function composition. But JavaScript lacks built-in functionality for composing and transforming functions in order to compose them. Uh, core, core .lambda, which is a part of Folktale, all parts up, uh, all, which are all parts of, are broken up in this modular way. Uh, they fill up this gap by providing tools for composing functions, altering the shape of a function in order to compose them in different ways. And, as well as currying and uncurring. 
I'd like to get into functional comp uh, composition, but due to time constraints, I'll be talking about tasks in instead, uh, particularly when compared against uh, promises. To demonstrate this, I have a simple example here that sets a timeout and has a bunch of console logs for clarity. When comparing the two solutions, you can see that tasks look exactly like promises. In fact, the only difference between the two solutions is that each instance of the word task is replaced with promise. But the difference between uh, becomes apparent when you run it. Notice in the left example with tasks, the code never sets the timeout and has never executed the, the timeout callback. Now let's, let's replace task with uh, a promise and do the exact same. Looking at the output here, it's interesting. The entire chain of actions fired right away. As soon as one, one has created a promise object, the callback function is promise, uh, passed to the, its constructor um, is also executed, which sets a timeout, etc. So which means that if you have an instance of a promise, the action has already started, and it might have already finished. For example, the, uh, the code sh here shows that promises can resolve immediately after starting. You might have already noticed this. The output code verifies this with it, its printing uh, made promise before printing the actual promise that was returned. In fact, if you copy paste the code into a browser like Chrome, it will show you the state of the promise is set to resolve in this case. So then when, when does that task execute its callback function? Only when someone calls task.fork. So here we have the same example as before, but we've added one line at the bottom. When running it this time, you can see that it doesn't start executing the task until fork has been called. The deferred execution has nice benefits. For example, you can compose tasks before running them. You just need to do it yourself. So here we've added a few lines in our example right before the fork. And we've also changed the task that we're forking into this new combined task. We use the task.chain method from the first task to return the second task, which implicitly calls the task, task2.fork method. You can verify this by looking at the output here, which first shows returning new task before it pr uh, prints out made tasks. And then it resolves, starts resolving one task and then finishes it before starting the next and finishing that task. And just like promise.resolve is a shortcut for creating a function that resolves with a given value, task.of can be used to start with a value. So here it just yeah, it starts with 21. You can even use task.map to quickly pass the return value through a composition of callback functions. Here we have task1 starting with the value 21. And it's mapped over and then gets multiplied by 2 and to get and return 42. That return value is passed to the next dot map, which subtracts 1 from it and to give 41. So task is an excellent way to combine functions, asynchronous or not, first, before starting to execute them. This allows you to prepare for any possible side effects. The structure allows you to model side effects, especially specifically time-based ones, explicitly, such that you can have full knowledge of when you're dealing with delayed computations, latency, or anything that isn't pure, or can't be computed immediately. A common use of this structure is to replace the, the usual continuation passing style form of programming, such as promises, in order to be able to compose and sequence time-dependent effects. I've only sc uh, scratched the surface of Folktale. Uh, there's a ton more you can do. Um, the maybe and either structures, for example, replace nullable types. And also, they com commonly uh, encode errors as well. Uh, future simplifies your a asynchronous code. Validation allows you to group failures. And there's just a whole bunch more. Uh, I encourage you to check it out if you're interested in functional programming with Java JavaScript. I'll include links to the docs and, and slides and put it on the Slack. So thanks for listening to my presentation. <laughs>